So, Michael, we got some new merchandise. People have been asking, uh, you know, how about some new designs, new stuff, and uh, here you go. I don't know if you've seen this yet. I love them. This is cool. I mean, uh, that's uh, the, the photo looks really great there on the T-shirt. There you go, Talking Sopranos. It's... You got it in a T-shirt. You got it in. Now, that's the black. That's uh, the black. The black T-shirt. You also have it in a tank top. A, or guinea tea, they used guinea to call tea. it. I don't think you could say that anymore. Well, we could say whatever the fuck we, we want it. on our podcast. Here's a guinea red. t-shirt. Red is it. it looks red. great in red. Comes in black, comes in red. Uh, Talking Sopranos, new stuff. Uh, on top of all the other great stuff uh, we've sold. And uh, people ask for it. You got it. Talking Sopranos t-shirts, Go to the website, right? The Talking Sopranos. Talking Sopranos. Wait, I got something that's, this is kind of a, we're selling a, a limited, you know, amount of these. And it, they, these are going to fast become collector's items because we're not going to make a lot of them. Um, this is the Steve Sharippa Motherfucks the World, hosted by Michael Imperioli mug. They're of extremely limited supply. They're going like to go it. fast. I like it. Let's explain to them, in case you haven't, uh, Steve Sherman motherfucks the world, is the video I'm going to make. Is the posthumous testimonial that Steve will leave us after he passes from this world. He's going to leave us all. You know, we're all in his will with this special video. There's going to be a big party, and we're going to premiere this video where Steve, what are you going to do on the video? I'm going to, everyone who's ever burned me, every scoundrel, Every scumbag, every person, scallywag. selfish, scallywag, scumbag. I am compiling a list. I Bad have tippers, no tippers. I have a list, 50 strong right now. 50? 50 strong and climbing. Uh, I will not having a funeral. I am uh, going to be cremated. My wife has a party for the people she knows that I like. Uh, they will be there. You, as my dear friend, will host the video. And we will play it exclusively at this uh, after death party, and uh, I will let people know what I really think of them. This is this is really exciting. <laughs> I mean, I I can't wait for this. This is this is. I really is appreciate really, yeah. I appreciate you hosting it. I appreciate you making that mug. That is a collector's item. Steve Sharipa motherfucks the world. It's going to be hard to get in the future, uh, but. Let me just throw this at you. Now, I mean, you haven't started shooting yet. No, it's no, still no. just in development no, no. stage. No. What about you do instead of the people you hate, the people you love and talk nice about people? Maybe. I think I think there'll be some of that in there. There'll sure. be some of that in that mixed sure. in. Sure. Absolutely. It's not going to be all negative, but there's so many bad people out there, and I'm going to fucking blow the lid off it. Because you know what? A lot of people, you, you think they're nice. They give you that bullshit. But I know the real truth, and I'm going to expose them. <laughs> I'm going to expose them, Michael. You're going to expose them for the scumbags they that, really that are. They are. They're phony. They give you the big bullshit. I'm going to expose them. Steve Sharippa motherfucks the world. Some of you, you know some of them. Obviously, I've talked about it on the podcast. But there's a whole slew of people. Not even you have any idea. Wow. I mean, I, I I'm, the suspense so is So get your me. mug. Hold it up. Get In the your meantime, Steve Sharippa motherfucks the Steve, world Steve, thank God, is... Healthy and will will be with us for a long time, I hope. But these mugs will not be available for a long time, so get them now. New merchandise, TalkingSopranos.com. What's happening, buddy? Ah, you know. Everything's all right. Everything's all right. What do I... Do I ever fucking beef? Do I ever complain? Yeah. Awesome. Do I ever have any beefs of anything? I'm a happy-go-lucky motherfucker. You uh, you are, have a lot of beefs very often. You know? I have, I have no beefs. I just go through life smelling the roses, my friend. That's it. All is well. I don't buy it for a minute. Really? But I'm you glad don't. all is well. I'm glad you're happy. Um, you know, we've given uh, over the course of this podcast a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people are interested in not just The Sopranos, but show business in general, the movie business, the TV business. And we've tried to give some, you know, inside information on, you know, what it's like uh, being an actor or being involved in this um, field. 
Uh, and one of the things I think might be interesting to people is pitching a show or pitching a movie idea to, or pitching a book idea, pitching a podcast idea, pitching to a, and pitching means a, it's literally a pitch, sales pitch. You have selling, an idea, selling. you go to a producer or you go to a studio executive or a network executive and you pitch your idea and say, and try to get them behind it and try to get them to want to make it. And uh, it's a skill like any other that um, you learn over time, I think. Because um, both you and I have not only acted, we've done some writing, we've done some producing as well. Uh, we've direct, pit- I've done some directing. We've well. pitched stuff together. We've pitched uh, stuff together. We did pitch this podcast together. Together. In a sense. Uh, we've pitched a uh, book coming out. Uh, that's coming out this uh, in the fall. Your book that's uh, inspired by the podcast that's coming uh, that we pitched to uh, publishers. Yep, uh, uh, and said and what we, it is. We went with Harper Collins. Uh, you know, you hear this a lot. My life's a sitcom. I tell you, uh, they need to make a story about my life and my family and my crazy uncle Louie. I mean, don't you always hear that? I mean, uh, you know. What people don't realize is the worst show that you hate, how hard it is to get that on the air. For that show, that show that you hate, that you think is the worst thing that's ever been on TV, there's 100 shows that didn't make it. Correct. That might have been better, that might have been worse or whatever, but to get a show on the air is a huge, huge feat. If you think the terms of like the regular network TV model, let's talk about that before we even talk about cable or streaming. The networks would buy maybe 50 pilots. And, pilot they, and they usually do that, sorry to interrupt you, but usually that starts in the summer. In July, the summer. August, September, like around there, right? October, and, Yeah, you know, uh, network TV. Now, May, now and it's... Then, Maybe even more. And then they'll weed it down and they say, we're going to shoot 30 of these as pilot episodes. And the, the thing called pilot season, which used to happen or traditionally happen in the spring. And they shoot, networks would shoot maybe 30 pilots. Out of those, only maybe, it could be anywhere between three, four, five, or maybe eight, nine are going to be made into a pilot. They're going to sh- uh, uh, they I'm sorry, they're going to shoot into a season. Yeah. They'll buy a bunch of them. Yeah. You know, they'll buy a bunch of pilots. Executives come in, pitch. Stars come in. Writers come in. They pitch the show. Uh, and then it gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. And they make a handful of them. And a, half, a handful of them make it on the fall schedule. And then only a few of those make it past the initial order, which is usually seven or 10 or 13, depending. So uh, how do you pitch a show? All right. Let's assume you have an agent. You tell your agent, I have this idea. I think it's a really good idea. Uh, Like, let's example me and you. Uh, You wrote a TV show uh, with me as the lead. Remember Brooklyn Pimp, it was called. I wrote a series for cable or for streaming. Uh, this is around 2012 uh, called Brooklyn Pimp. And it was Steve uh, Fish Out of Water, basically, pilot of a guy from Brooklyn involved kind of on the fringe of the mob invol- and uh, winds up in Venice, California. And we teamed up and with Warren Littlefield. We, pit- we, we pitched it to Warren Littlefield who uh, if you watch Seinfeld, the character Russell Dalrymple was kind of based on Warren Littlefield. Warren Littlefield was the head of NBC uh, and he greenlit Seinfeld and was a big champion of, of giving Seinfeld some time to build momentum and build an audience. And then now he produces, uh, he's the executive producer of Fargo. Yeah. And he actually had Fargo right around the time we were pitching. So he loved our idea and he took us to a bunch of, networks a bunch um, and a bunch of them and it we you know people like the idea they just it wasn't enough in the package or the idea wasn't enough for them to pull the trigger but obviously warren thought it had a lot of merit and i i certainly liked it um 
And we went to Showtime, and we went to HBO, HBO and we went and to Stars, and Amazon, and we went a whole bunch of places, and Stars. we got shut down. And you know, the hard thing is, um, people want to be involved in, t- in the TV business with uh, proven showrunners. That's the biggest feather you can get in your cap if you ha- if you have a showrunner that's part of your package that has already ran a show on TV and has had some success doing that. You know, without that, they're taking a big gamble. So I think that was one of the things that, um, because Warren was more of an EP, uh, executive producer, rather than a showrunner at that time, at least. Um, So that was a a thing that was a little bit difficult. The subject matter was a little difficult, maybe, or whatever. You know, they're not going to take everything. Um, Well, take them through the steps. Tell them. Take them through the steps. So so we have this executive producer, and he set up a bunch of meetings with the studios and networks, and you go in. And basically, you're going to give them a sense of what the show is. You're going to talk about the, you know, the premise. You're going to talk about the main characters. You're going to talk about the pilot episode. Really, a lot of the pitch focuses on the pilot. Pilot is whether it be a half hour show or an hour show. This is what the pilot happens in the pilot. And then you say, so going forward from the pilot, these are the storylines. You know, These Steve's character is going to go through this journey. Steve's wife's character is going to go through this journey. Uh, the end of uh, end of the pilot ends like this. The end of season one is a cliffhanger where we think he's dead and he's going to come. Is he going to come back for season two or not? And um, basically, it's, you know, it's a sales pitch and you're trying to get them really excited and, and, and you know, express the details of an idea that you hope is really unique and something different, something new and something they'll get behind and buy. And then uh, so you go in. And, you know, usually your agent, if you have an agent, they set it up. I mean, they're not seeing people unsolicited. You're not getting in there. You're not going to NBC on your own and knocking on the door and they're going to see you. Can't even get past the lobby anymore. I want to let people know, right? So hopefully your agent sets up a meeting. You're with the head of comedy or the head of drama, depending on your status. And there's three or four people usually you're pitching to, various – you know, department heads and assistants and sometimes casting. And you give your pitch and usually you practice it with who you're pitching. Like me and Michael went in, the three of us, Warren Littlefield would set the table. Then me and Michael would explain and we go bounce back and forth. Now, when we pitched that in 2012, I had also pitched my last book, kind of similar, 2013, so I think we were all for like 10, me and you. And then I went out with that book a month later with a, a different writers and different people, my last book, Big Daddy's Rules, for a sitcom. And I think I was like 0 for 13. So it was like 0 for 23. I'm flying myself to L.A., putting myself in a hotel, paying for everything, and you're just getting the shit knocked out of you. And I got to tell you, I know people love the sales pitch. I don't, you know. Uh, no, it's and hard. after a, a while, pressure. you know, they're not interested for one reason or another. They don't like the story. They've seen the story before. Uh, there's a million reasons. Uh, uh, I personally have sold about six or seven shows. I sold one to ABC with my first book years ago. I uh, sold one to Fox, to FX. Uh, I sold one to the Cooking Channel, the History Channel, Discovery. Some got made. Some I just shot a pilot. Some I didn't even get that far. So it's a crapshoot. But if and when you can get it done, you know, they make a deal with you. It's all good. But you keep jumping over hurdles. So, yeah, okay. NBC wants your pilot. Great. They're going to pay to write it. And then they write it, and they're going to go over it, and they're going to give you notes, and they're going to go, okay, let's make this show. They're gonna, you're going to make one. And you make the one pilot. You cast it. Then they're going to you wait months, and uh, they're going to decide if the show gets on the fall schedule. If you get over that hurdle... <laughs> Now it's September, October, show starting. How's it do? They don't have much patience to network anymore. They don't give it time to uh, find an audience a lot of times. They, you know, a lot of times you're six and done. 
you know. No, and they have a, a limited budget for promotion, and and sometimes they'll put a lot of their money behind a show that they think is going to be that they they have the best shot at being a hit. And some of the other shows don't get as much as a promotional budget, and they it's a little bit of an uphill battle to find an audience. And it's also. Uh, you know, sometimes you're on a bad night. You're following a, a show that's not getting ratings. Uh, you know, tough There's nights. a million reasons why you won't you have a success, and it's not always because of the quality of the show. No, no, that's no. the one thing. Yeah. You, you, you know, everything needs to be aligned. Being funny or being, uh, you know, good is not enough to find an audience, especially nowadays where there's so many choices. So, so many choices. But, uh, you know, that's what, you know, people think it's easy. Oh, this show sucks. I have a better story. Right? You hear that all the time. I have a better story. Listen, let me tell it to you real quick. You know, uh, it's not easy, you know. And the same thing with the book. You know, the agent sets up meetings. Say, I have an idea for a book. You give your pitch. Uh, usually you're in the room. This is pre-pandemic. <clears throat> You're in the room. You go there. We to did the our book pitch on Zoom. On Zoom. Yeah. And most of the pitches I've done this year were on Zoom. But, but you know, you go. I mean, all of them. All of them, actually. Yeah, this year. And probably, uh, you know, uh, the, the, for the foreseeable future. But you usually go set up the meeting, sometimes two in a day. And you go into these rooms and you tell them why this book is going to be great. And it's going to be a bestseller. And you usually only write 25 pages. You don't have to write the book. That's not how you usually sell it. You're usually selling the idea, you know? And yeah. uh, For my novel, I had already wrote the whole thing. Uh, it yeah. wasn't something that I pitched. I wrote it, and then I found a, a publisher. Indie. I wanted to go an independent route. I, um because it was my first book and I didn't want to get into a situation with like a, a publisher that wanted to give, you know, make big changes and do so stuff with it. I wanted it to keep way. it what it yeah. was. Yeah. My first yeah, book so was I, Random House. It was Random House. The, it became the Goomba's Guide to Life. But originally they wanted a cookbook. Uh, oh, really? Uh, they wanted a cookbook and I explained I didn't cook, but I had a bunch of stories and we went out to a, Agent went out to three or four uh, places, and uh, we pitched, and they liked the idea, and they paid us to, uh, you know, write the book. Right. So that's how it usually goes. But but you know, like I say, it's it's people think it's easy. It's it's not easy. I I pitched early on, before The Sopranos, one of the worst ideas ever. You ready? The Playboy yeah. Channel. All right. We were going to go on the road with rock bands, big, you know, real groups, you know, Moody Blues, Pink Floyd, uh, you know, real groups. And it was going to be a setup, real groups at the concert, a fake roadie and a girl tries to get in backstage. It was all going to be a setup. And she goes, she seduces the guy. She bangs the guy backstage. A fake roadie? A fake roadie. Real concert, real backstage. So the, but the band is in on it? The band is in on it. Okay. Fake roadie. Guy's a roadie. Here comes the girl. She wants to get him backstage. Whatever the scenario, she fucks the guy, blows the guy, whatever it is. It was a terrible idea, and obviously we didn't sell it. But at the time, I I don't know. You know, so it What's the show? Every, that's every the show. week, that's what well, happens? Well, you know, it's the Playboy channel. So it was like basically really just the sex, a little music and the sex. That was the show. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, it's a terrible so wait, idea. So next week, it's Van Halen playing the L.A. Coliseum. Correct. And the, it's the same girl or new girl? No, different girls, different guys, different roadies, different girls, different scenarios. And is it always a girl groupie and a guy roadie or sometimes you mix it up? I, I, I don't remember that part. But it was like that. So there's going to be sex involved, rock and roll, and sex. That was the show. And we pitched. And we went into Playboy, and they kind of liked it, believe it or not. And so it was it a, it's not a reality show. Well, it was a half-assed reality show at the time. This is 19, 
96. 1996. What was the name of it? I don't remember. But I was with two guys, uh, an agent from L.A., a guy named Casey, uh, and myself. Uh, and he was close with some Playboy executives, and we pitched that show. And it wow. did not work. So that was, I also sold a show about Vegas called The Miracle Worker to FX. That was I, a good idea. I sold I like it in the room. Idea. I actually sold it in the room. Yeah, that's uh, a good They said, idea. we want to make this, yeah. And we didn't get past the pilot stage, but, uh, you know, I've had other shows that I could well, swear that happens, were, you know. were great ideas. It's very frustrating. But there's some people you talk to, they love Love, love the idea, the whole scenario, the pitching, the setup, the driving on the lot of Paramount or Warner Brothers and, you know, giving the ideas and going over the pitch. There's people that just love this, producers. I hate it. I guess so. I mean, uh, I find it to be a lot of pressure. It's not that fun. I, I don't mind auditioning as an actor, you know. That I don't mind as much. Sometimes I find that fun and exciting, but pitching is a lot of pressure. Because, you know, at, at least in an audition, you're acting, you're pretending to be someone other. In a pitch, it's just you and you're, well, you, you know, it's a you, sales pitch. Well, you kind of have to sell yourself also. You know, yeah, they're looking at yeah. you like one of the shows, uh, the, the one, The Goomba's Guide to Life, I was going to be the lead. This is in 2004. Uh, I that was going to be a show? It was going to be a show, a sitcom. ABC, uh, you know, I sold it to the head of the network, Mark Pedowitz at the time. Now he's a head. What of was CW. the show going to be? Uh, it was about a guy who owned a limo company, Italian American guy. You know, at the time, I think they had George Lopez, and they had Damon Wayne show. So you kind of had the black family, uh, the, the Bernie the, uh, Bernie Mac, a Latino maybe. family, and this was. Going to be the Italian guy. You know, I had a daughter and I owned a limo company and a wife. And, you know, it was kind of a fish out of water. So then I got hooked up with the guy that did Mad About You, uh, the head oh, writer yeah, there. And, and and we tried and nothing ever happened. And, you know, I got paid and that was the end of that. But I did a pilot. What was the fish out of water element? Like you're a limo driver, but what's the... Uh... It's a limo driver. His family was all... Uh, uh, his wife was sophisticated. His wife was uh, in a neighborhood. You know what I mean? The gotcha. kids were kind of snooty. It was like, this guy's like the Ralph Cramden kind of, you know, right, uh, right, right. slash uh, uh, Rodney. Donald O'Connor kind of guy. Yeah, like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, not Donald O'Connor. Uh, uh, all in the family, a little of that. Uh, you know, he was that guy, a blue collar guy surrounded by unblue collar, you know. Whatever. Right. Uh, you know, I, I would have liked that to go, but it was during The Sopranos. I got paid good money, but people have no idea what it takes. So even when you see a show and you go, boy, this sucks and I hate it, uh, they worked really hard at getting that show on the air. Yeah, and often it's very established people who have had success before, both as writers, producers, directors, and actors, and stuff that will never get on the air, and you'll never see it. And I think also, uh, like you said, more than the actor, even as a star, because we've seen Robin Williams, Bette Midler, we could go on and on and on. Huge stars have had failed shows. Yeah. It's the writers and the showrunners that they want to be in business with, you know? Yeah, and you never know if a show's going to... You could have all the right ingredients. It could be good. You could have great people, and then it just... does. The timing's off. I mean, it's not the good a good timing for the public. Public's not in the right head for this type of material or whatever, or it just doesn't gel. Some of it's alchemy, you know. It's just kind of ma there's a magic sometimes that. And and you know, listen, uh, you know, sometimes they bury a show and it gets preempted for football or, or March Madness and can't find an audience and they're scrambling and. Yeah, it's far. It's very hard, but. Somebody's it's doing it. It's a necessary evil. You got to keep plugging away. Uh, see, we didn't have to plug the podcast. I mean, did we have to pitch the podcast? No. no. We didn't actually pitch it, did we? No, we had no. uh, 
it's kind of a no-brainer, right? It's kind of you and me happened. talking about The Sopranos. <laughs> well, I remember I interviewed for you for the job. I remember I had to audition. See, that it was wasn't very only hard. you. I, 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 I thought Who about else did you audition? Little Carmine. Uh, I auditioned him for the job. I auditioned uh, some of the crew guys to do yeah. the show with uh, one of the crew guys, uh, Janice. What would have been better than Bobby and I think you made Janice. a big mistake. <laughs> Bobby and Janice doing a podcast. That would I think that would have been the way to go. This, I think you, you kind of blew it. You almost blew your audition. <laughs> but I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> It seems to have worked out anyway. We're halfway there. I don't know. There. On paper, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Let's take All a right. break. All right. Very okay. good, pal. We're back. I have to, uh, I, I need to do a shout out to my friend uh, Gene Bolmarsic, who is a trademark attorney who helped me out with something. Uh, I hired him and he did an amazing job. Uh -huh. He went above and beyond. If, if any of you are uh, starting a company, branding something, trademark issues. It's a whole, you have to deal with the government, the copyright trademark office. It's very difficult and complicated. Gene Bolmarsic, he's in uh, Connecticut. It's B-O-L-M-A-R-C-I-C-H. -B he can do it right. He's really good. And I, uh, I'm going to have him trademark Steve Shripper motherfucks the world. Well, I mentioned that and he said, uh, he said for you to call him. Okay. You know, uh, this was for a project that I'm I'm working on. You know, I got my finger in a lot of pie, Steve. I'm also an inventor. I don't know if you knew that as well. No. I have three patent pendings. They all have glitches that I have to work out, but they're all really cutting edge. Can you, know. you tell? Can you tell me one of them? I can. One is self cleaning underwear. So you put it on. <laughs> you put it on for three months. You don't have to change your underwear. Three months it uses. It uses your body's own metabolic system to clean the fabric. A so lot of people don't four, change their underwear anyway three months. You only need four pairs a year. It's seasonal, oh, wow. spring, summer, winter, and fall. You know. And you've been, um, have you tried this out? Have you been I've uh, got prototypes. I have a beta. You know, I have people using it. The problem is some people have been uh, having trouble getting them off. They've had to be surgically removed. But if I iron that out, I think it's going to be big. That's like the girl I can get the, one to you guys. You want me to send you yeah, a pair? I'm a, I'm a 3X. You want to try it out? 3X. 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 Uh, I'm on it. It's like that girl with the Gorilla Glue in her hair. She had to get it surgically removed. But besides that, it's working really well. The other thing is the rainwater soda fountain. So it's a container, different sizes. You put it outside your backyard, outside the window, on your porch. It collects rain. And then it turns it into soda. Really? You, you get I got and I got the I got the Different cola, flavors? the diet cola. Huh. I got the root beer. I got the lemon lime. The only problem I'm having is with the orange. I like orange. The orange that orange tastes like pee pee. I can't figure it out for the life of me. Everything else is working perfectly. And the orange smells like pee pee. Tastes like pee -pee. it tastes like pee pee. Yeah. And do you have diet? Does it do diet sodas also? Diet, cola, and cola. Well, only diet. one diet. And the That's amazing. Yeah. The third invention is edible stationery. So like Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, you buy candy and a card. This combines the two. You can write a note, a love letter, whatever you want, and it you, you kind of crumble it up, and you eat it, and it tastes like a fine Belgian chocolate. I like it. And you the know problem what? with that is paper Why? cuts. I haven't – paper cuts. You know, I had a paper cut. I haven't cut. ironed it out yet. I, I had a paper cut on Blue Bloods. Did you know that? They had a CGI. I was wearing a Band-Aid in the scene. They actually had a CGI it because it would not stop bleeding. I couldn't get were, it to stop were, bleeding. I licked, were you trying to eat I licked script? an envelope. It was around you Christmas. Licked an envelope. I licked an envelope and I cut myself and it wouldn't stop. You know, I loved the, the, I liked the third idea the best. And the reason is, you know when you get a card... Like, how long do you keep a card? How long do you keep the envelope? Okay, happy birthday. True. And now you don't want to throw it away. You feel bad. You shove it in Couple the drawer. Of days, yeah. You know, now I could eat it. It's you can eat it and enjoy it. I'm working with a chocolatier from Brussels. He's so helping it's me out not uh, it's... Talking Soprano. It's, it's had nothing to do with Talking Soprano. No, I have a own. life outside of Talking Soprano, Steve, despite what you may think I do. 
I have a whole other life. Well, apparently, I, you know? I didn't know that. I don't yeah. want your partner. I'm a busy guy, Steve. I got a lot of irons in the So fire. you're writing shows. You're acting. You're producing. I'm all over the You're I doing your Buddhist over. stuff, your meditation classes, and inventing. And, and inventing. And podcasts. Oh, nonstop. And writing a book. And working on hosting your posthumous video, yeah. Steve Sherp, a motherfucker's world. Now, listen, I have some interest. You know, from the uh, from the networks, they're interested, but they want to turn it into a series. Listen, it's going to be uh, a lot of work, a lot more work than you think, because the names are piling up daily, daily. And there's no way you would be willing to do it before you die. No, that, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense, does That's it? That's what they want. That's How what they want. How we have a funeral? Want. How are we going to have the funeral? And and there's no funeral. There's a party. No funeral. No, I'm being cremated. My wife knows who to invite, who not to invite. You're hosting. That's what it is. She knows. Yeah. She knows. Well, Jeff, I, I asked Jeff Sussman if he'd negotiate my deal with you or whoever's producing this because I haven't, I don't know what I'm getting with my back end points. I don't know. <laughs> You want to be paid for this? <laughs> of course. I thought you were going to do it as a friend. I thought you were going to do it as a friend. If I go in front of a camera, I am a union actor. I got to be paid. I don't so get away So you want that. my wife to take a piece of my estate uh, and pay you? That's why I'm shopping it around to, to network so it doesn't have to come out of your estate. So I'm you want to get a take spunk? food out of my wife, Laura, who you've known for 20 years mouth. I'm trying. I'm going to get her she paid even this. more. She from needs the this in her, her retirement. We'll talk about this. Steve Sharippa, motherfucks the world, hosted by Michael Imperioli, season four, episode twelve. Eloise, uh, this is the final appearance made by Furio. He's the only character, uh, the only big character, to. Uh, you know, to leave the show without being killed off. He just... Really? Really? Uh, goes back to Italy. The only character that you just don't see anymore. He always had the option to come back. He always had that going on. And uh, uh, he never came back, but he always had that option. So he wasn't dead. He wasn't off the show. He never got the phone call, I don't think. And, Christopher's uh, in rehab. He's not in this episode. Rehab. No. Is he in and Bobby's oh, only in. I was in. Uh, Chris was in rehab. Bobby's just in the courtroom, right? In the courtroom. He's not in much. Uh, a little bit. It's written by uh, Terry Winter, who's right. written uh, a, a ton of episodes. Uh, directed by James Heyman. I don't know him. See, I didn't meet him because I didn't. I wasn't in this episode. I guess I, I met him, on but I don't, rem I don't remember meeting him. He's uh, he was nominated for two Emmy Awards. Ugly Betty. And uh, he directs both comedy and drama. It's a good episode. Not one of your favorites, maybe. Uh, good episode. It's a little, it's a sad, it is a kind of a downer vibe to this episode. It's, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know how else to put it. Well, I think um, it is because of uh, Carmella is pro heartbroken, as is Furio. Yeah, Heart but it's it, that's reflected in all the scenes. It seems it's not uh, you know, but uh, May, uh, maybe you, know. you didn't like James Heyman's directing. Maybe because I'm not in it. I don't know. Maybe because you're not in it. You're hardly in it. Maybe could be, but I, but I'm not in uh, numerous ones. Okay, let's start the uh, courtroom. Junior's trial. The DA says Junior is a ruthless old man in charge of a criminal enterprise. He's not buying this. He wants Junior to go on trial. And Bacala is sizing up jurors. He's looking to see who could they zone in on. Uh, soprano yeah. Kitchen. And that's Bruce McVitie who plays Danny uh, Scalercio, who's the guy, that the juror that they get into. Bruce is a, uh, is a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. I first saw him. He did American Buffalo with Al Pacino on Broadway. He really? replaced uh, James Hayden, who OD'd during the run of the show. When I saw the play, Bruce was in it. I was just starting acting school and I went to see this play. He was on Broadway. He's been in Million Dollar Baby. He, I was in a movie with him called Last Full Measure, uh, January Man. He's been on Law and Order. He works all the time and he's a great guy. We met on the 52nd Street Project. Tell me about um, James Hayden. 
Uh, he died. Would he? Would was he headed for a bright future if he didn't over die of an overdose? Yeah, he was also in. He was in Once Upon a Time in America. He had a part in that. He was on Broadway with Al Pacino in David Mamet's American Buffalo, which was a really big deal. I, it was 1983. I just started acting, and I went to see it, and it was. Uh, um, but before I went to see it, this young actor, James Hayden, was in it. He had a really bright future ahead of, and ahead of him, and he was addicted to heroin. Which, think about it, you're doing eight shows a week. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, he was young enough that his body could deal with that up until a point. And then he, during the run of the play, he, uh, uh, Bruce McVitie was his understudy. During the run of the play, he died. And um, it was very tragic. I guess it's 83 or 84, right around when Scarface came out. Right around then. And uh, um, he would have been a star, you think? He's, I didn't get to see him in the play, uh, but I heard he was incredible. I mean, Bruce was great in the play as well. Uh, and so was Pacino. I mean, I'll never forget. I mean, he, 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 Pacino, it's a three-character play. The first, you know, Bruce and J.J. Johnson are on stage. Pacino enters about 10, 15 minutes into the play, and it was like a tornado came on the stage. I mean, he if you've never seen Al on stage, it's – it's it's quite exceptional what what he is as a stage actor, but he just makes this entrance, and his first lines are fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie. I mean, he says it like twenty times. That's the first lines that he delivers. But it was just it was the first time I had seen him in person. He was my favorite actor, and it was just a big big experience for me. I'll never forget it. Uh, you know, you talk about the heroin. Uh, did you see this guy, a, a professor at Columbia, says he does heroin most nights. Uh, uh, he went on the record. He wrote a book. He's the head of the psych, uh, psychology department at Columbia. Yeah. And he does heroin. He snorts heroin. Says there's nothing better than sitting by the fireplace after work. He's married with three kids. And it helps him bring life and work together. Uh, he claims he's not addicted. And uh, this is part of his lifestyle. What, what do you have? Not to say a lot of people that? could pull that off. Yeah, I'll say that it's not an easy one to pull off. Well, that's like the old joke uh, Richard Pryor said. Uh, you know, I'm not addicted to coke. Uh, shit, I've been doing it for 25 years. I'm not addicted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go. The Soprano Kitchen. Carmela's making scones. AJ reads the paper. Fiorio arrives. She's very happy to see Fiorio. He says, uh, house smells like heaven. What is she making? She asks him if he'd like a scone. He says no and indicates he's watching his weight. And here comes Tony barreling down the stairs. Uh and he grabs. You know, it's interesting that, that he says Furio says there's a leak maybe in the foundation. Remember in the last episode, the rising damp, which is the code name Janice uses when she goes online to kind of uh, mm -hmm. mess with mess with Bobby Junior. Bacala Junior. And also Tony in the dream in the last episode was there to fix the masonry. You know what I mean? So it's a it's kind of a weird. Do you think the uh, uh, a leak in the foundation? Uh, is talking about the foundation of Carmela and Tony's marriage. I a hundred percent because if you think about it, the next episode after this is all about a White house. Cats. That's a sim and it becomes about the disintegration of their of their marriage. You know, basically. AJ oh, is very almost. rude. Very rude. No, he's he not a great. Say hello. He, he doesn't he's say hello to Fiorio. Do you think he? suspects on some even unconscious subconscious level something weird's going on between his mother and furio i i i, I maybe maybe but he's i not don't the brightest so. bulb not let's, let's bright at it, all you know. he's a dim bulb is right uh tony comes and he's down. talking about uh billy bud he's doing a paper on billy bud it's actually an un, was an unfinished novella by melville um which is about this uh innocent kind of good looking well liked young sailor who is abused by this sadistic uh sergeant in arms to the point when the the young guy kills this sergeant in arms uh a, a lot of people think it's about kind of repressed you know homosexual feelings and stuff on, on the part of the sergeant well, in arms we'll get into that later on yeah uh, with carmella uh 
And Tony says he's got tickets. Let's go to the Ocean Club, Paradise Island, three days. Me and you will leave tomorrow. She comes up with all kinds of excuses. The skin condition, uh, AJ, who's got time She to doesn't want to go with Tony. She no. doesn't want to go with Tony. She, she doesn't, doesn't want to be in a romantic mood, in a, man, a romantic situation with her husband at that point because she's hopelessly in love right now. And he grabs her to dance a little. Furio is jealous. You could see that. He says, oh, I'll wait time. outside. It's very awkward. Uh, uh, AJ goes upstairs. Camilla doesn't want to go with Tony on vacation, like you said, just flat out. And uh, Furio doesn't want to see this, so he waits outside. He doesn't want to see it. He's really – and then when Tony gets in the car and starts talking about his problems and about uh, – Carmel and Furio, really, you see the resentment. You know what I mean? He just... Yeah. Uh, he doesn't like Tony you know, talking about her that way. Not at all. And he resents Tony for being insensitive to her needs. And uh, it's it's very tense. She could be a moody bitch. Uh, the golf course. Uh, Carmine, Johnny, Little Carmine play golf. Uh, uh, little Carmine and, and Johnny uh, are going to try to fix this HUD thing which is Tony had gone yeah. down to Miami. And uh, then Big Carmine comes. He forgot his Desinex, which is Desinex for Jock, is for Jock is, What is it, Jock itch? You know, then the hugs and kisses with little Carmine and Johnny Sack, like they're, it's all bullshit. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? The whole, like, we, lo we love each other, hugging. You know, it's all just bullshit. They, you know, Johnny Sack would have would squash him like a bug if he had the opportunity, if it was it was going to make him be the boss or whatever. But Little, but little Carmine, uh, you know, he's there to try to fix this thing, and he claims to with uh, Johnny. And then when his father comes and he says, uh, there was a time I would be proud, the soprano kid, to be uh, my own son. I would have been proud to call him my own son. Little calm, I don't like that. Horrible uh, treatment of his son. No, he doesn't like it at all. It's uh, it's really it's really cruel, you know. Uh, and yeah, you know, we get the first uh, th those um, not the first, but the the malaprops. Uh, he's a bit of a poseur. Yeah. <laughs> he says he also says it's a uh, the Bach. What does he say? The, he calls it a de debacle. A debacle. Debacle. He calls the debacle a debacle. Um, it's very, the, he's very funny. Ray plays this, it really this well. This podcast is a debacle. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> this episode or in general, the whole In show? general, the whole podcast is a debacle. <laughs> From beginning until the day we end it, debacle. Uh, Johnny you Sack, know, the Johnny comment. Sack, what, what, what you could tell what Johnny Sack is doing is, you know, he, he just. He's trying to get Carmine pissed off. He's trying to raise, make tension between the families. You could see it. This is what he's doing. You know, basically the plan is to have Tony kill Carmine. Yeah. yeah and that's he's trying that we to see. kind of. But in the meantime, I think for the time being, Carmine and Johnny Sack, a uh, little Carmine and Johnny Sack, we're going to talk to big Carmine. And that goes south. Uh, it goes south. Yeah. And uh, he's not interested. Uh, Johnny Sack gives him dirty looks. We're at Furio's mother's apartment. It's a small space. Uh, Carmela uh, says, "You know, we could, uh, you know, pick out different flooring." And they're getting very close. It looks like they're gonna kiss. They stare at each other. It's very real here. Yeah. You know. And then uh, Uncle Zio comes in. Correct. Have you thought about flooring? It's all right there. It's almost they're about to do it, and then Uncle Zio comes in. It's very, very, very tense. I would um, love to go there. It's a date then. He said, yes, it's a date. Uh, Min, uh, who is Nucci, uh, <laughs> Paulie, she's very good. Uh, she's very good and very nasty. She's a nasty old lady. Na but I got to tell you, uh, Nucci, Paulie Walnuts, his mother, she's a drama queen, She's a bit of a whine, a pain in the ass, don't you She's think? She's a bit of a pain in the ass. That's uh, true. They were in the up, car. Uh, Julius LaRosa. I worked I with Julius LaRosa. see La him perform. You know Julius LaRosa. Huh? I worked with him 9-11 uh, at Mountaineer. Uh, they, uh, a few weeks after Mountaineer, they had this Italian festival. 
and it was me and Johnny V, I believe. And they had this. And Italian it's festival. near it's near Pittsburgh, right? And yeah, out that way, yeah. West Virginia, Chester, West Virginia, and uh, we went there because the owner of it said, "If you come, we'll match." You know, I had three friends died nine eleven, and he said he would match, and he gave me a big check. He gave me a check, I don't know, for like forty, fifty thousand dollars to give to the charity. So me and Johnny V and Julius LaRosa was one of the singers, and Dick Contino. You know Dick Contino? No, legend, who's that? legendary accordion player. Look him up. A legend. It was me, Johnny V, Johnny Dark, uh, all kinds of Italian musicians. Me and Johnny hosted it. Julius LaRosa, Dick Contino, fantastic. Fantastic. And she's talking about Julius Rosa. And, uh, you know, he got fired on the air, the Arthur Godfrey show. He was fired on the air. Wow, really? Uh, yeah. Famous story. You could look that up. And uh, she says how good looking he is. And they're talking. And Min makes a mistake and hits another car. Uh, Nucci's telling her there's a handicap by the door. They rush. In the parking lot, they ram into the car. Cookie's yelling, I'm bleeding. She starts crying. Casino, Tony, Silvio, O'Brien, Patsy. Marty, our, our old friend, uh, the late Jerry Grayson, playing Marty. Uh, he's doing a joke about a guy who had a customer who wanted to take a leak in the sink. Go right ahead. You're my guest. <laughs> all, all you know, joke. Jerry was a comedian. Jerry was a Boris Bell comedian in the 60s and stuff, so it's right up his alley, that kind of material. Um, Furio's really angry in this scene, watching Tony with the hooker. Furio's not interested in the hooker that he's with, but he's watching Tony, you know, being unfaithful or about to be unfaithful, and it just really, really pisses him off. Yeah, because he's saying, uh, I should be with Carmella. Look at this guy. He doesn't appreciate what yeah. he's got. Uh, they, uh, Tony is drinking heavy. He tells Johnny, he tells uh, Silvio, Johnny Sack wants to sit down to straighten this out tomorrow night. Uh, Silvio, always the voice of reason. Maybe we should get back. Uh, Tony wants to hang. Uh, Brian, Carmela's nephew, the financial guy, he's drunk. He's out of his league, this kid. He's, he, uh, he, was, he was before Paulie Walnuts' coming home party, and now yeah. he's out of his league again. He, he's, he's trying to hang, and he's just not. He's yeah. bombed. He's drunk. Tony's drinking heavy. Furio uh, is staring. He's not happy at all. We're in the hospital. Paulie, this is supposed to be like uh, Foxwoods or Mohegan yeah. Sun, that type uh, of place. Sun, India, absolutely. It's Connecticut or something, yeah. Absolutely. Let's take a break. Okay, next we're in the hospital room. Paulie arrives. Nucci and Min are sitting in the waiting room. Uh, she's a little shaken up. Nucci is a big drama queen. It was such a crash. Cookies in the x-ray with three stitches. Uh, the, doc the doctor questions uh, Min's eyesight. Her eyesight, yeah, exactly. She says it's... Uh She's offended that he's saying she needs she needs glasses. He says, I'll drive. They talk about the producers, and he's going to drive. You, did you see the producers when it was on Broadway? No. No, I didn't get to see it either. That was Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. When, yeah. uh, it was supposed great. to be fantastic. Yeah, great. Yeah. That was a big ticket at the time. Big, big ticket. That was a huge ticket, and uh, supposedly Nathan Lane was incredible. Yeah. He's incredible whatever he does. The guy is – that's that's a Broadway legend. Uh Listen uh, to the doc. You shouldn't be behind the wheel of your age. She says, I've been driving since I'm a young girl. Paulie says, horse and buggies don't count. Paulie's uh, a little pissed off at her, you know, for getting, you know, putting her, his mother's life in jeopardy. He's already was a little pissed off at them for mistreating her. But, uh, you know, he says he volunteers to drive them to go to the city to see their Broadway show. Meadows' new apartment. Carmela arrives. Colin and his mother. Colin's... Uh, uh, Meadow's roommate, I have to tell you, your daughter's something else. She's going places. Uh, she's singing her yeah. praises. Uh, she's the mature. She cooks. She volunteers. She's great. Uh, it makes makes Carmela feel good, certainly. And then uh, the other roommate, arri uh, Meadow arrives with the roommate, Alex, played by Alexa Palladino, who's also in Boardwalk Empire, actually. 
Uh, Meadow, uh, they are. I don't know. I keep waiting for him to say he loves me, and he doesn't. He, She's upset about Finn. He doesn't want to tell her he loves her. And Carmella, very – some men have to move at their own pace, man. Own she's pace. talking about Furio. She's talking about Furio. Some men have to move at their own pace. Interesting. Yeah, uh, exactly. The casino, Brian and Tony Stumble. Brian's bomb. He's a fucking lightweight. He <laughs> couldn't hang with he's us. He's way out of his league. No, no, no. He, he couldn't hang been, with uh, us in our day. Some uh, people tried back then, and they, you know, if they couldn't, they couldn't. They, they were left by the wayside. Well, Jamie Lynn's ex-husband, he tried <laughs> to hang with us. He the got sent upstairs guy. by Tony Sirico. Tony Sirico got pissed. He was bomb. We started drinking three in the afternoon. By nine o'clock, he was a goner. Tony told me, get him the fuck upstairs. I had to walk him up to his room. Uh, yeah, he was a lightweight. He couldn't hang. Uh, Brian and Tony uh, stumble in. We got to go. Marty, the, hooker, the limos uh, are on the way up from Norwalk. Right, and the hooker recommends the... The chopper, which Marty did not want her to bring that up. That was a bad move because that's expensive, right? How much is a helicopter? For? A lot of money. I don't know exact price, but uh, way you know, more than a limo. The president asks. Uh, the president asks him. Uh, they lost fifteen thousand between five of them. That's not much. Nothing. And to get he said a hundred grand, maybe they'd be happy to get him a chopper. Fifteen grand, it's kind of a law. They're going to break even, maybe, on this whole thing. Not that terrible. Plus, they've been eating and drinking, and who knows what else, right? Uh, they're probably paying for the hookers, the casino. I would assume they're probably they picking that? up that tab. In Vegas, they did that. I bet, huh? Sure, I did that in the old days. I you did, did that? that? I did. I had. There was an act. A, I think I talked about it. There was a comic I wanted to bring in. And he was get, he, I couldn't get an answer out of him. And uh, I said, I told the agent, tell him I'll get him a hooker. The phone rings two minutes later. He's in. So I go to, uh, I have a friend of mine who deals couldn't with Couldn't get his own hooker? No, he's an idiot. I go to Petty Cash and I take, you know, $250 out of the cage. And uh, a buddy of mine, he meets and. It goes up to his room. He's got a hooker. So for so two fifty, I got under, the deal under done. Expenses. Had to, yeah, under, uh, can't put on the hooker. I had to do petty cash. Petty I had to cash, do petty yeah. cash. Yeah, a lot of uh, casinos. I still think some of that may go on. You know, uh, you know, a casino host. You're a big high roller. You lose hundreds of thousands. You want some girls. You know, that that goes on. They pay the girls one way or another. You know. Yeah, there's still some Makes of that sense. goes on. So uh, they agree to it, reluctantly agree to get them the chopper. That's not what they wanted to do. It was no. bad. It was a loss for them. And he puts on a good face, Marty. Uh, you know, they lost a lot of money. You know, it doesn't warrant, you know, uh, a chopper for sure. So he says, that's how I'm going to get home. Now they're at the chopper. Brian's puking. Tony and Furio are there. They got to take a piss. Tony's very drunk. There's no way they could piss under the chopper. It would be spraying all back on their pants. I, I, I also, I don't know. I mean, to take your, uh, your dick out anywhere near a rotating propeller is a big mistake. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I kind of question the logic in that scene a little bit. They get a little too close. I mean, you can go, I don't know. That's a little scary, right? Have you, have you, you've I, been on I, a helicopter. I, I, I've never been on a helicopter. I don't think I would go on a helicopter. They crash all the time. Well, I've been on a helicopter a few times, and it's you don't want to go anywhere near those propellers, no, man. It's I, scary. I, I, Very they careful keep going to the Grand there. Canyon, and they crash. They always crash at the Do Grand they? Canyon. People keep on going on them. I, 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 I pass on the, the, the chopper. You know, not for me. Furio's thinking about it. He's looking at Tony. They're pissing. And he looks at him, and then he grabs him. And for that split second, he is going to push Tony into the propeller and kill him because his uncle at the father's funeral said, the only way to get the woman is if you kill the boss. They always he's looking that. around, and nobody's watching, and I guess he, he could have easily could done be, it. It, could, it, could be, it would be considered an accident because Tony was drunk and maybe he stumbled into the thing. Tony is shocked. 
It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Does Tony remember this or not? Is I don't it, think he remembers it, it, but at that moment, I think he kind of realizes that he might have been doing that. Yeah, at the moment he realizes it. Yeah, it's, uh, and then Furio thinks twice, doesn't do it. They get in the helicopter. Uh, you don't even like small planes, right? No, 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 no. Remember that time I I came in with Jim and, and Roger from Atlantic City to Foxwoods? You were waiting for me? Yeah, I was drinking like Patron. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I got heartburn. It's horrible, horrible. A tiny four-seater, horrible. Were you surprised you got heartburn drinking Patron at four in the morning? Yeah, it was warm ten Patron, in the morning. ten in the morning. I took it out of my room. I don't think it was. I don't think that's why you got heartburn because it was warm. It was probably because you were drinking at ten in the morning after probably of drinking all the night before a lot. Yeah, right? but then, but then it was warm, <laughs> so I got heartburn. Then I brought the, the it wasn't sandwiches. the it wasn't the fact that you had. 30, 30 Patrons the night before, that had nothing to do with it. Then, it was the fact that it was warm that and gave then, you heartburn. <laughs> and then I brought a meatball sandwich from the White House in Atlantic City, the oh, famous that's a good sandwich place. store. The deli, yeah. And I was hurting. I was hurting, yeah. That was the beginning of a, a, a terrible weekend because Friday night I was in Atlantic City with Jim uh, doing a, an appearance. Saturday we were all at Foxwoods. And then Sunday... We were Sunday down in morning. Florida for the finale. We flew to Hollywood, Florida, the Seminole Hard Rock for the finale. Yeah, that was a. It was a rough. That was a marathon. That was a rough uh, seventy-two hours, and then <laughs> some. Then we that went one, to Danny DeVito. Then yeah. we went to Danny DeVito's restaurant. You didn't come. I didn't go. He no, opened up home. a new restaurant in Florida. We went, Stevie, me, Johnny V, a bunch of the guys, and. Uh, you know the seats were really low to the ground. I guess so. When Danny comes around, he could was look he you there? in the eye. Danny was there. Yeah, they had meatballs, and Dan Marino was there, and the guys from Always Sunny in Philadelphia were there. And Danny's a terrific guy. I like Danny DeVito a lot. But yeah, he is. The the really seats nice. were really low, so it's like Danny. You know, he's looking at you right because Danny's. Swear and you had God. meatballs again. You had meatballs in meatballs Atlantic City, again. and you had meatballs again. Huh? Two days later. It was a tough. Maybe that's why you got the heartburn. <laughs> I'm sure well, that no, didn't hurt. Wait, 72 hours. Now I had another day. 96 hours. It was a bad 96 hours. You probably <laughs> shaved a few years off your lifespan. I'm, I'm, huh? I'm sure I did, pal. Uh Soprano Kitchen, Tony walks downstairs. He's very hungover. Carmela's sitting at the table. What's that? What's your hangover cure? I wanted to ask you that. Do you have one? No. I take care uh, of the dog? No, never. No. Sometimes would, you need that, though. Sometimes the hair of the dog does a little, helps you a little bit. I just take, no? would take three Advil before I go to bed at night. Stick to one thing. If I'm drinking vodka or vodka or beer, that's it. But what about in the morning? Nothing. Nothing. I have to have enough sleep. Drink water, have enough sleep. No coffee. hair to the dog, no? No, You're not a hair to the dog. No, no. Can't drink the next day. Because then I got to start all over. And I would have to drink all day. I, you know, you like to have... But you don't have to drink all day. Yeah, I but mean, when you, you were drinking, dog. You, would, you were a guy that would have a beer or some wine in the afternoon. You would have a Heineken. You would have a glass of wine. I, I don't do that. For me, it was all or nothing. We're going to go all in. All right. Or not. I can't have two glasses of wine. I don't want that. I, you never saw me drink in the day unless I was, you know. Unless drinking, you were drinking. going in all in. All yeah, in. That's true. Right. All in. <laughs> you never saw me just get, hey, bring me a little glass of red wine while I read this book. No. You know. Uh, F uh, Tony's uh, downstairs. He's very hungover. Where's Furio? 40 minutes late. She knows exactly how late he is. Well, she's yeah. waiting for him, right? And she's like, uh, was he out with somebody last night? She wants to know what he was doing the night before. What she was he doing? Tony... Did he have a date? He says, how do I know? He's a single guy. Where do I know where he was? Uh, he asked for coffee. He, so, he smells the coffee. He's so hungover. He He's got to go back to bed. I'm going back to bed. Don't wake me up. Meadow calls. She uh, says, let's go... Uh, you know, why don't you guys come over for dinner Sunday? 
Dad could see the place, meet the crew. Finn, and we're going to go skiing in Canada. And bring wine. We only drink good wine when the parents come. When the parents, yeah. Very nice. She's inviting them. Uh, Carmela calls uh, uh, Furio's phone. Goes right into voicemail. Uh, and, and then, then she, drives by the house. Yeah. But when she when when Meadow called, she thought it was Furio. So she was a little disappointed. You know, and Meadow yeah, kind of calls really, her out. I mean, she's head over heels. Crazy. Carmella pull, uh, drives up, pulls away, sees Furio's car's not there. Johnny's new restaurant. Johnny and Carmine. Tony and Silvio arrive. They want to work it out. They offer again. Give us 40%. We'll forget the other stuff. Just give us 40%. I mean, Silvio's flabbergasted. That's where we were at. Yeah. yeah, but we start fresh. You don't owe us what you already got. It's a terrible, insulting uh, but I deal. think it's I think Johnny Sack wants Tony to be insulted, so he'll be pissed off enough to sanction you know, to kind of help Johnny Sack get rid of Karma. I think You're that's really what's right. going on. They say we got the chef from Fontanella's restaurant. What is, is that? What's Fontanella? Fontanella means fountain, but it also is the soft bones on a baby's head that have not fused yet into the whole solid skull. So it's a very I think there's a, a bit of a joke with that name. Um, there, is, is there a restaurant called okay, Fontanella? I may, there may be. I don't know. They but name it after the bones kind of, of a baby's head? That's not I don't know. It's, kind of, it's not appetizing at all. Uh, no. They toast no. with a shot of Sambuca. Did you like Sambuca? I like it in, ca in espresso. I used to drink. At one time, I used to drink, like after I drank wine or whatever I was drinking, I would drink chilled Sambuca. Uh, uh, with beer backs. Ooh. Oh, 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 no, that's not for me. And it I would like be it like syrup, it would be really thick, like syrup. Yeah, no, uh, and I would do shots of that. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they show him the picture. Uh, used to hang in uh, LaGuardia, Mayor LaGuardia's office. This picture, very Fiorello LaGuardia, yeah. Mayor of New York. Yeah, uh, Carmela leaves, uh, leaving the church. Leaving the uh, church. Ooh, ooh, that then we haven't seen this woman Darlene before, have we? No. But she says she's How a are realtor. You? Yeah. She said, Thank you, uh, Furio Gunther. Said how you say it, his house just went on the market. So this happened the night before? Um well oh, a couple it doesn't nights, necessarily have to be. You know, from the time Carmela drives by Furio's house, or um, actually from the time we see uh Met when Meadow calls Carmela to this this scene, there may be a couple of days. A couple of days. So he goes, he goes to the real estate. They list it. He's out of there. They don't. Tony doesn't know it yet. Uh, now she does. Furious. It's also she, three o'clock. You notice at that point. Three o'clock again. And she's coming and, out of the church. At and you're not going to tell the audience ever. Oh no, I can I can never do that. Not even at the end. The last. Our last episode There's of the podcast. There's a few things I want to tell the audience at the end, but that's not one of them. <laughs> I understand. I'm sure you have a few things, too. I understand. Uh, Furious House. Uh, Carmela arrives. Uh, the house is empty. She looks in. The, all the furniture's gone. Everything's completely gone from Furious House. She's got Great a Great shot. You know, the, he, the director, what, what he does, he pulls back. He's in a close-up of Carmela and then pulls back. And she's really small in the frame looking into the door into this empty room. And it's just like, you know, it, it really kind of reflects her her feeling of just loneliness and loss and, and, and being isolation right at that moment. It's a she's really sick. cool move. She, she got punched in the stomach. She's sick oh, about she's this. Oh, you know? she's absolutely yeah. gutted. She's absolutely gutted. Tony's yeah. parking the car in the street. Carmela and AJ are with him. Uh, listen to this, he says. Furio called the stupid fucking zip, moved to Italy, moved back to Italy. Asshole left a message on the answering machine at the Bing at 4.30 in the morning. So you think he forgot it's, you know, I mean, that was a very big move that Furio pulled. Well, he might have forgot at the moment, but, you know, usually when you're drinking, you forget. And then, Things are like, hazy. So, yeah, but then somebody bring it up. Hey, last night. Oh, fuck! I forgot. Michael was there. Or, oh, I forgot. Johnny showed up. You know, usually it jaws. You know, unless you're in a complete blackout, you it, it, it'll pop up. It may take a little while, but 
it'll pop up. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you may be, you know, uh, he did say you were getting too close. Maybe in his drunken haze, he's going to think that Furio actually was trying to help him or save him or move him. Very I possible. Know. I, I got to tell you this. Uh, Meadows of Palm, I got to tell you this. Tony Soprano, who is a generous man, there's six of them. He brings one bottle of wine. Hmm. That's right. Is it one he, bottle? That's he it. walks in with one bring, bottle. They brought a case of water. Yeah, Evian water. Unless there's wine, wine in there. Unless there's wine in there, maybe. Could but be. one bottle of red wine, there's six people, not counting AJ. Mm. Right? That's an inconsistency, I'd say. Yeah. It's not in character. He would buy he would bring a bunch of wine. I would uh, say so. Especially if she asked for it. Yeah. Because he's uh, being really, he's being really. Um, he's trying hard here. Friendly, diplomatic, trying to, you know, be, you know, kind of sweet, and and uh, I think he's proud of his daughter. He wants it to go to go well. And we Carmilla's meet. being impossible. She won't even. Carmilla uh, is in a well, bad. She, she's being, uh, yeah, because she just heard about Furia. She's in a bad mood. She's in a she, bad mood. We meet Will Janowitz for the first time, who plays Finn DeTrolio. Will was in uh, or Borwick Empire, Mad Men. He's a. Uh, I worked with Will on a writing project for a couple of years. Uh, we were working on adapting the Bad Lieutenant for TV series, that we sold first to Fox, then to Universal, and to and. Uh, both studios eventually balked on it, but I, I've worked with him on a few projects. He's a really talented writer. And you like him. He's a uh, nice kid, right? He's a great actor. I think I think he did a, did a wonderful job with Finn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's a very talented writer. He also wrote a, a really good screenplay that's being produced called Bang Bang about a boxer. That's great. He's a excellent actor and a big talent. Uh, you know, he meets Finn, Finn the dentist. He says, I'm waiting to hear back from uh, dental school. They got a nice apartment. It's near Columbia, so it's on the Upper West Side. Uh, there's a guy, Colin, is it? Colin and Alex, they both live there. Colin and Alex. Yeah. Uh, Car uh, Carmilla doesn't want anything to eat. She doesn't want anything. Of course, she has to fix the napkin yeah, on the table. She's got to do that. Uh, she, uh, you know, she's... Uh, Meadows preparing chicken cacciatore. Tony's opening the wine. Being very cordial, kind of fun. He's looking to have a good time and, you know, embrace, uh, like you said, Carmela, her roommates. This is a big step. She's a sophomore living in their own apartment. Nice apartment. Uh, Alex and Colin certainly seem like nice kids. Nice kids. Like, Tony's uh, a little, um, you know, he kind of, Balks a little bit when he sees that uh, Finn doesn't live there, but uh, the other guy does, and he finds that a little off. It's a little strange, but um, yeah, Carmela. You know, but he not, likes to, you know. Carmela's not digging this whole thing. She, she, you know, his uh, Meadow went through the trouble of making stuffed mushrooms. Try the fucking mushroom, you know. You know? Tony likes it. He says have one. They're good. And Carmel is just in a really pissy mood and doesn't. Does, she's not participating. You know what no. I mean? She's being. She's resistant to everything. And it's not like her. This is not how she acts. She would always be all in. You know. No, uh, normally, uh, right? In yeah. a situation like this, with her daughter going to great effort and cooking a beautiful meal and being yeah. mature and being welcoming, and she usually she would eat that up, and she's the yeah. opposite. A Johnny Sachs restaurant, the the window, Carmine's restaurant, whatever it is, window smash. They just Little do Little Paulie a number. and his crew. And Boy, they, they just, do a uh, number on this place. I mean, they they they, do. The they have a good the, time doing it. The Lagar, uh, you know, I got to tell you, Tony got big balls doing this. Big balls. I mean, he just destroys hundreds of thousands of dollars. That uh, LaGuardia picture, they draw the giant deck and. It's a real, a real slap and in the face. Carmine's one of the owners, right? That's basically yeah. oh, how they're yeah. setting this up. This I, is I a big think, slap in the face. The boss of one of the New York Five families. I would think Tony could get killed for this. Over that, maybe? I would think so. Uh, Meadow's apartment. Uh, Finn's asking AJ about uh, school. I guess Rutgers. AJ, a very dim bulb, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, you got to see on the paper I did on Billy Budd. Uh, and, and Carmela's, oh, that's ridiculous. 
uh, you know, see all the work you did. Tony says, hey, usually he gets D's or F's. That's good. Uh, my teacher says it's a gay book. She's saying that's ridiculous. You know, it's a, it's not a homosexual book. Uh, you know, they're trying to shove it down your throat. Uh, the whole gay thing, TV shows, uh, movies, you know, all of this stuff. And Meadow's kind of mortified. Oh, it's horrible. She's being very, so uh, homophobic. Um, I mean, Billy Budd does have those, uh, you know, elements in the story without a doubt. I mean, it's... It was a movie, actually, Peter Ustinoff directed the movie starring Terrence Stamp. Who Terrence Stamp's a really good actor. He's done, uh, you know, my known from Superman 2 as uh, General Zod, I guess. He was he was in that one. But he's he's uh, he also worked with Pasolini and Te- uh, Terore- Teorema in that film. And The Collector, Smith's fans would know Terrence Stamp from, he was on the cover of the What Difference Does It Make single. But... Um, yeah, she the the, the students the, these college kids know exactly what the movie the book is about, and she's embarrassing herself. It's oh, terrible! Kind of really, really, really awkward. She says, "Carmela, gay stuff is ruining the education system, movies, TV shows." She sounds really ignorant here, really ignorant, very obsolete. Uh, yeah, she uh, sounds says, like a uh, you know kind of a uh, provincial suburban housewife here you know and, and uh, you she, know, she fancies and, herself someone who appreciates culture and and that's really not what's happening uh it's very funny tony asks the roommate if he's gay however it comes out he says you're not gay and then he gives metal a dirty look it's very funny you know because he he's assuming the guy's gay it's okay if she lives with this guy in the apartment if he's gay you know but that's not the case uh Meadow uh, says that uh, he lectures at Columbia. Col- and uh, Carmelo says, well, maybe he's gay. Oh, Leslie F- uh, Fiedler was uh, lecturing at uh, Columbia. He pe- he was a, a, a scholar, you know, about literature and was a big fan of The Sopranos, actually. He passed away in 2003, but was very excited that they were talking about him on the show because he loved it, uh, you know. But he was uh, he's written a lot of books. Um Really, there's um, a lot of silence, literature. silence, awkwardness. She comes off kind of ignorant here, I'll be honest, you know. Uh, the bada bing back room, Silvio and Paulie talk. I love this scene. I love it, and it's one of my favorite quotes, uh, which means a whole lot. Very profound metaphor. You're only as good as your last envelope. Yeah, that's a big one. Show business, you're only as good as your last role. Doesn't matter what you yeah. did 20 years ago. Doesn't matter you won Emmy Awards. It doesn't matter you were nominated. It doesn't matter I was on The Sopranos. It's what have you done lately, and that's all they give a fuck about. Short memories. Short memories, right? Yeah, so and and it is true when it when you apply it to this mob structure, right? It's of course. Like we've seen it so much, so many times in the show. Who gets a pass for doing horrible things as long as they're kicking up a lot of money? This is what it's all about. Like we've talked about a million times, money. But but the the only as good as your uh, last envelope is basically in life. You know, how many times have you done a favor for a friend or a family member and? You know, they have a short memory. Yeah. You know, they, you know, five years later, hey, you forgot that I helped you get that job? You forgot this? You forgot that? Yeah, they did. It's only what have you done for me lately? Basically the same thing. Uh, I like here, you know, he's telling Paulie off the record, certain people are starting to wonder where your heart is. Uh, they're kind of a little wise to him and him playing. They don't know specifics, but they know – He's been, uh, you know, he's been uh, maybe feeding some information. Uh, well, the fact that he's mad that Tony sent little Paulie to trash Carmine's restaurant. He works for me. Little, He's saying little Paulie works for me. Well, they all work for Tony. Tony can sure. send whoever he wants. He's the boss. Paulie's mad because it's creating tension with Carmine. That's the problem. Sure. The Carmine sure. maybe think Paulie's behind it and he's trying to get in good with Carmine. And then he calls, you know, he calls, uh, uh, he says, I go back with Johnny, Paulie says, and he calls him a weasel. He calls uh, 
Silvio, Silvio stands Silvio up. Weasel, and he's pissed off this whole, all the tension he thinks started with the Russian, which was Silvio's fault because we were picking up Silvio's the five money. Grand. Uh, Silvio was sick. We were making a stop. We were making a collection that Silvio was supposed to make. He's I, resenting. Uh, I that. like it. I uh, I like the scene a really lot. Really good scene. I yeah. agree with you. Really, really good. Uh, they're in the social club. Johnny meets with Carmine. How do you want to respond? We got to break this guy's back. This is what I don't understand. I, I don't want to do this. It's got to be called a union. But Carmine is also suffering by calling the union. Is he not? Yeah, because he's going to make money from the Esplanade project, big time, yeah. But um, Carmine's got to do something. I would have thought he would have went after somebody, not go, you know, kill somebody. And know? Johnny's happy to stir the shit here. He's happy that there's tension because if there's a power vacuum, he's the one who's going to rise to the top if Carmine goes. Uh, Vesuvio Restaurant, Carmine and Rosalie are eating. We had a date to go to Color Tile. To look at the towel for his mother's apartment. No phone call, no note. Uh, she's pouring a heart out to Rosalie. She, she says, I almost threw up the sacrament, which is a, you know. Uh, really. A couple of months ago, you'll forget about him. But that's the uh, the irony. She's in her head cheating on her husband, but going to church to confession. It's all fucking warped. And well, it's and all Rosalie contradictory. Says, you know, it was a date. There was no date. The date to go to color, to, you know what I mean? You, they didn't sleep together. They didn't even kiss. Ro to Rosalie, it's all like a, you know, a nothing, a big nothing. She's a mess. She gets up, she go, goes to the bathroom crying. I mean, uh, Carmela is uh, not taking this whole thing well at all. But like I said, she went and got confession. Did she confess that I'm having sexual thoughts about Furio? Did she say she so. had confession? She says it in well, the what's scene? the sacrament? Oh, sacrament is the Eucharist. I think so. I don't know. I think oh, it the is. Eucharist. What the the, Eucharist. The, the the fucking thing they give you when you have the confession? That's not confession. No, no, you don't have to have confession to have that. It's two different sacraments. Eucharist is one sacrament, and so is confessions in different sacraments. So you still know. Yeah, you, you you still have the Catholic stuff in case you decide to bail out on bullet Buddhism. No, I was uh, uh, when I you was a kid. A, I I would learn that stuff. But so you have the Catholic as a backup, just in case. No, I just as a kid I was exposed. If to all it. goes, fa it. if all fails, if all fails with the Buddhism, you could always slip right back in. You know well, all it's the rules. Not going to fail with the Buddhism. What do you mean all fails? Well, how does it fail? <laughs> <laughs> There's no fail. <laughs> There's no fail. If they kick you out one day. There's they no kick you out. You're out. They, you they don't follow the Buddhism That's rules. Impossible. Get out of here. There's there's nobody that has the authority to do that. If you ate a steak, would they kick you out of Buddhism? Bud uh, vegetarianism is not. Uh, a lot of Buddhists are not vegetarian. I, I didn't become a vegetarian because it's a it's a you know a, a rule of Buddhism because it's not. A lot of Buddhists do eat meat. Oh, they do. I go to, I there's not there's kill. not like a lot of rules in Buddhism. To be honest, it's not about a bunch of rules that you have to follow. It's remember, much more just uh, uh, about dealing with your own mind. Because Arthur said the Dalai Lama used to eat steaks. Arthur knew the Dalai Lama. I just told you, a lot of Tibetans, Tibetan Buddhists eat meat. That It's a cultural thing. There's nothing in Buddhism that says you can't eat meat. Now, a lot of Buddhists choose to be vegetarian, but it's not a rule. There's not a ton of, like, rules. Now, There's what ethical about, behavior that's been, you know, that's, you know, part of the uh, Eightfold Path that the Buddha laid out but it's it's not like you can't do this that's not how it is there's none of that now Arthur Nascarella who played Carlo who's been on our show he said that the Dalai Lama used to play second base on his softball team in New Jersey no that's what do absolutely you not true could the Dalai Lama turn a double play that is not true I don't know what Arthur <laughs> was talking about but that's he's confusing the Dalai Lama with somebody else because the Dalai Lama played for his second for the Yankees like Willie no, Randall he didn't no he didn't no no, no. okay definitely that's what not. he told me he told me that definitely not yeah he I'm sure he's <laughs> confusing it with somebody uh that's a I'm telling the truth I heard him say that no I know he said a lot of things that we know that we've questioned in the past too. This whole uh, uh, 
the ghouling theory, which we've never we've never been able to corroborate. I don't Has even anyone know if ever heard about ghouling? Let us know. <laughs> TalkingSopranos dot com. Let us know if you heard about ghouling. Uh, Paulie eats with Nucci Min and Cookie. Uh, that restaurant way- is Rue 57 on the corner of 57th and 6th. It's a good one. It's open really late. Uh, I don't think I, it's I like open that. anymore. I think well, I was there. I was there about a year and a half ago. Uh, no, I've been this to is Rue 57. Corner. It's a good place. Yeah, uh, it is a good place. But Paulie shows me nothing here. I mean, they split the check. I mean, he says we'll pay for parking and gas. He's a three old ladies in their 80s. He doesn't pick up the check. I mean, what could the check be? Another hundred dollars or so? Why does he got to pick up the check? Oh come on! You would have picked up the check. He doesn't if, like those two ladies. He they're pissing if, him off. That's Din, my point. Din is complaining. I didn't see what all the fuss was about. Listen, he doesn't know. like. Listen, he doesn't like the ladies. They're not very nice to his mother. But maybe if he picked up their check, maybe that would help. You know what I mean? Well. What happens here, though, they talk about Salvatore, her husband. He did well, Salvatore, and Paulie's realizing this old bro's got money. He says, Barbara Scissors. She says, uh, <laughs> what does she say? Precision? Precision uh, cutlery. Cutlery. And then it comes out that I need. I got a $100 bill I need to break. They talk about money not in the bank. Under the mat, and Paulie just hears that loud and clear. She wants to see it. I want my hands. I, I want the money uh, right in my hands. Still keep it under the mattress. They're joking. They go to town uh, on the rolls and the sweet and lows and the sugar. I mean, they go to town on it. They go to and, town. Anything and, that's free or not or whatever, complimentary, they take it. Paulie says Richard Kiley in The Man of La Mancha sang the impossible dream to his mother. Everybody in the audience probably thought that. <laughs> you know, Johnny V once, uh, we went to a charity thing. Christina Aguilera was singing. It was in the Meatpacking District. He he said she kept staring at him, Christina Aguilera. He says, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. She was staring at me the whole time while she was singing. She was staring right into my eyes. <laughs> Maybe she was. Maybe she recognized him, Artie Buco. Maybe. I guess it's I guess. It's Were you there? Yeah. She wasn't yeah. looking at you. She wasn't looking at me. <laughs> Are you sitting next to him? I'm not I'm not I'm not the Christina Aguilera's type, I guess. <laughs> Were you next to to Johnny? Yeah, I guess I was. I, I, yeah. But you didn't oh, know. No, maybe her not. Maybe not. I was at a table. He might have got up. She was like performing off to the side. Uh that was that made me laugh out loud. Uh Paulie splits the check. Bad move. He should have paid if you went if you took your grandmother's friends to to see the producers you would have picked up their check you know that I don't know did to, but Tony didn't uh, Paulie didn't go into the producer he just drove them okay I'm getting I'm just, that sense, right I don't I think he would have uh, you know he should have picked up their check Esplanade construction site Patsy Vito and Benny are sitting around doing nothing and here comes a big giant rat. Uh, when there's a strike or there's a problem with the union here, a lot of places, but certainly New York City, they do this blow up rat, and they to bring it in to embarrass the bosses or the co- the owners of the company to into improving the contract or whatever it is. Right? Very embarrassing. Uh, uh, the, uh, the bodega, the juror Danny is with his kid buying candy. Eugene comes in. Uh, Eugene says, we know you'll do the right thing. That mob thing, the junior soprano trial, we know you'll do the right thing. You're a guy uh, like you is on that jury. He makes it very clear. Hardworking guy, wife and two kids. So they know he's got two kids. They know he's married. We know you'll do the right thing. There's an American flag right behind them as they're saying, as they're talking to him, which is kind of interesting. It's he's available. buying candy. He pays for his candy. It's a veiled threat, not very veiled. Veiled. (laughs) Not very veiled. It's not very veiled. It's a threat. And it's, you know, it's it's scary. It's very scary. It's got the young uh, kid. It's right there, you know. Soprano bathroom, Carmela's crying. Meadow calls. 
Uh, did I do something to piss you off? What are you talking about? Well, I know you were kind of mad at me the other night. Anyway, it's my birthday. Uh, let's go to the plaza for tea under Eloise's picture. Which Eloise's early picture. on, and remember early on, they were going to go and Car uh, Car Carmela Meadow suggested it. Meadow didn't want to go with her. It's their tradition. It's a, they do it. Their tradition, yeah. Eloise was a book uh, about a little girl who lives on the top floor of the Plaza Hotel with her turtle and her dog, I think, and her nanny. It was written by Kay Thompson, and uh, there's uh, somebody thinks that it might have been based on Liza Minnelli, the, when Liza was a little girl. Really? That Elo Eloise. Yeah, I've, I've read. I've heard that that Eloise may have been because Kay Thompson, I guess, knew Judy Garland. And may have based the character on uh, Liza Minnelli. I don't know. Uh, the plaza certainly isn't what it used to be. It used to be no, really elegant. No. And then the new owners came in. And it's not what it used to be. It's My shame. wedding night, that's where we were. You stayed at Sweet over there? At the plaza, my wedding night. Yeah, I did. Um you know how much it is for tea at the plaza for one person? $75. Tea and you get the little scones Cuc and you get and the, the, the cucumber uh, uh, the, the finger sandwiches and a little bit of probably a little small cakes and cookies stuff. Seventy five a head. That's without tax and tip. So you're uh, talking what a hundred dollars? It's a lot of well, money. Well, it's crazy. Parking, it's a lot of money. You know the parking, the the twenty one club uh, closed here. You know in New York. I shot there with Tom Selleck on the scene from Blue Bloods. We shot a scene there. What recently? A couple of years. ago. A couple of years, couple ago, years ago. Yeah. Okay, so the 21 Club closed. He loves that place. He does? He went there with Sinatra, he told me. Yeah. So the 21 Club closed. Uh, I've been there. It's a, uh, iconic. You know, it's got all the jockeys out front, and it's been around for over 100 years, and et cetera, et cetera, well, uh, et cetera. Well, Sweet Smell of Success, is shoot, they shot. Uh, Tony Curtis. Scenes. Great movie. Really good movie. And Burr Lancaster. Uh, I love that movie, and the scenes in the 21 Club are really cool. So it's closing, and they're saying it's a shame, da, 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 da. and it is a shame, but a hamburger is $38 there. Do they think maybe that has something to do with it? $38. No, I, I think a martini. It is that it, it's, it's, it's COVID. It's, it's been closed, and they have Yeah, no but business. it's been closed the whole COVID time. It's been there for right, 100 before years. Before that, it was thriving. Before COVID, it was thriving. Correct. Yeah, you go there for the experience and you go $38 there. $38 hamburger, uh, $24 martini. I mean, you know, they want a certain clientele. Well, you're going to live or die yeah. by that. You, know? you want rich people. I don't think Obviously. there's, I don't think $38, no hamburger is worth $38. Oh, but you're paying to go, you're paying. To be in that, you know, the legend in the scene, you know, the environment, like the plaza. You go for tea at the plaza because it's the palm. I, I, I think I that understand. is the palm court, that room where we, I understand that, tea. but don't. Not everyone, especially during the pandemic, can afford that. That's so, true. You know, you know what I mean. I mean, some things are ridiculous. Like I, you've got money, I've got money. I could afford a thirty-eight dollar hamburger. I'm not paying thirty-eight dollars. I don't give a fuck. No, that's it. No, I. I Either. Somebody, but if I eat a thirty-eight, cool, it's got a great vibe. I I, I understand. It's exciting to be there. Apparently, they have an one of the great uh, wine collections, wine cellars. Like I just really don't feel incredible. you know. It's I a think shame they have that... a bottle of wine from like, you know, I think their oldest is like a hundred and twenty-year-old bottle of wine or something. Like that. You know, that's all I'm saying. There's certain places you know and I know they're overpriced just for the sake of being overpriced. If I eat a thirty-eight dollar hamburger, somebody better be jerking me off under the table. Then it's worth it to me. Well, I think that would that would cost a little more. <laughs> I'm just telling you, really. Yeah. I, you know, I dated a girl years ago, and, and that and, you know that kind of takes my appetite. I mean, that the idea well, of those it, things it, it, together. Years, years ago, I, I dated. I don't a girl. want to mix those two eating and that. I mean, you know, at a hamburger. What do you mean at the table? Somebody's going to do it. There's a, years ago. We looked at a menu many years ago, 30 years ago. A Dover sole was $49. A lot of money. Where was this? At the uh, Ritz Carlton in Laguna. And we're looking okay. at the menu. You know, we didn't go in. We're looking. I'm going, holy shit. 
$49 for, uh, you know, it was 30-something years ago, $49 for a Dover soul. Somebody better be jerking me under the table. And the girl said, and someone better be fingering me. Who said that? The girl that I was with. So did you arrange it? <laughs> no, we didn't go there. My point is, there's but no do you reason want to, to do pay. that at the table. There's no, I don't understand. There's no reason to to charge that kind of money. Is my point. But you would care. do it if that happened. If, yes, if you had. Then I, yeah. the if, if the waitress came over. See what I'm I, saying is, I, I, like I, I don't want to do that at the dinner table. To me, that's gross. Well, if a girl said to me, uh, if the waitress comes over, uh, I'd like a hamburger. How much is that? Thirty eight dollars, and she jerks you off, sir. Okay, get me a hamburger. Put cheese on that also, and I'll yeah, have no, a glass no, of wine. Now, now you're mixing eating and that. It's I don't know. Food, I keep those things separately. Food Not George and, Costanza. He no, liked the cured he, meats. He, he cured TV, meats. food, and sex. Cured the meats. trifecta, he called it. <laughs> he had the TV but going I mean, and serious. the cured meats. You know and I know a lot of places are just there because they can rip you off. They rip Taurus off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Listen, I, I, it's you, you know you're going to pay pay a lot of money to go to those places. That's that's the nature of that. You know, listen, I don't think it's a ripoff. I just think it's not my thing, but some people like it. Part of Big Back Room, Tony, Silvio, and Vito. Uh, they meet. Silvio, stubborn old fuck, shut down the Esplanade. Vito's got a good idea. Uh, he says, uh, you know, we can uh, torch their cement trucks. I like that. Fido says we could, you know, we could torch a few cement trucks. That's retaliation. Tony says no, just sit tight. It's going to cost us. Tony says it's going to cost them too. Tony's getting pushed around because it's Jersey. You know what I mean? There's, they feel like New York really, they really kind of don't have the respect that they have for each other. Obviously, the well, family. Car Carmine said it earlier. Uh, they, what? What family? They have a glorified crew. Glorified crew. And Phil Leotardo says at some point that pygmy thing. We got the five New York families in that pygmy thing in New Jersey. He calls it. Yeah. Plaza Hotel. Carmela and Meadow are having lunch. Uh, Carmela uh, Meadow's really grown up. She's a. She, she's grown up. She's. Uh, she's a good kid. A good too. kid. She's Very good respectful. Daughter, right? yeah. Nice daughter. Nice girl, smart, doing everything. She, uh, you know, Carmela wanted her to go to Columbia. She wore that on her sleeve, and now she doesn't like what she's seeing. She's also a little jealous of Finn and Meadow, I think. She's jealous, which is interesting because the book Billy Budd, right, is about jealousy. Or, the you know, the, the inciting incident happens out of a jealousy based on kind of, you know, a sexual thing and, and, and an infatuation type of thing. It's interesting that that's the parallel here. But, yeah, she's jealous that Meadows, you know, Meadows in love and has somebody who loves her, and she's she's not getting that, and he's gone. The object of her affection is gone, you know. And, she, she, and then Meadow refers to her mother as Mrs. Danvers, who's a character in the book uh, Rebecca, and uh, who resents, she's very resentful of, you know, the uh, the master of the house who falls in love. And she's, she's uh, I think, a maid or, a, you know, or, and she's jealous of that and, try, and resents the love that she sees, that she's uh, not participating in. Meadow, Wednesday morning, he's going to pick me up at home. I have my ski clothes. I'm going to stay the night uh, and do some laundry. Is that a problem? No, of course not. As long as he stays in the guest room. Says he's not staying. Why aren't you happy for me? What am I, a child? Well, what have yeah. you got against love? She says too. Yeah. What have you got I don't. I love? don't blame Carmela. I don't allow my daughter's boyfriends to sleep with them at my house. And my daughter's engaged, and they both live with their boyfriends, and they've been with them for a long time. So, and so they live with their boyfriends, but then when they're at your house, they can't sleep together. Correct. Not wow. under my roof. Yeah, I've never had to uh, make, make that, that decision. decision. And no. I would be the same thing if it was a boy. It's not because it's a girl. I just, when they're married, then they could, maybe they could do Cause it. Because you're, you're very re religious. And no, I'm not religious. Marriage, as no, religious as nothing to do with it. I know they have sex. 
Uh, they live together. They're together for four, four and a half years. I like the guys. I don't want them having sex where I could hear them in my house if that happened. I don't want to hear that. Yeah, I understand. I, understand. I don't do that. You know, I don't want to be uh, uh, me and my wife going at it crazy while I have guests in the house either. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? That does, certainly. Sometimes the, mo- the mood takes you, though. You never I know. I understand. So if I come down to visit you and I stay in your apartment, me and my wife, and I'm banging the shit out of her and I we're going it, I, crazy, it, you wouldn't mind? Just put a necktie on the door so I know not to open it. If you hang your <laughs> tie you on mind? the door, I'll know. If, if my wife's howling, I'm screaming, boom, boom, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. You, you're okay with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't be okay with that. Okay. No, I may record it and play it back to you. I said, do you see what you, you want to hear what you sound like? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could sound like this again. Blue Chew, Blue Chew. Uh, there you go. Wedding reception. Paulie uh, walks over to Carmen. It's a very strange coincidence that they're there. It's his housekeeper's, I don't know, it's Carmen's, Carmen's house- housekeeper's daughter, and it's Paulie's third cousin to the groom. You know, I think what happened was Paulie probably heard somehow that Carmine was going there and maybe got himself invited. Why don't you invite me? You know what I mean? Maybe he wasn't invited at first and then kind of convinced them to invite him because he knew Carmine was going to be there. It's a great scene, though, when when Paulie comes over uh, and Carmine doesn't know who the fuck he, he is. He gives him a kiss. No, I, no idea who the fuck he is at all. It's great. Go over, Paulie great Galtieri, your father. Your father got run over by a trolley. <laughs> <laughs> which we know Paulie doesn't even know who his father was so that's not correct uh, Johnny, Johnny uh, talk to you about me Johnny who? Sack? talk to you about what? he has no idea and Paulie's just the the rug he, has been completely pulled, pulled it's a under. punch in the stomach he goes in the bathroom he is devastated that Carmine doesn't know who he is and Johnny Sack has been lying to him Mind to his face, and what? And I think in this moment, this is a change of heart, and he realized he's got to put all his loyalties back yeah. in his in the Tony Soprano. Absolutely, uh, Soprano House. Carmela goes through the mail. Tony eats at the table. Uh, she sees a postcard uh, from Rome, you know, the, the Colosseum in Rome, and I guess has a moment of hope, thinking it's from Furio. Furio, and Carmella's it's just heartbroken. A hair you it's know. a hair salon that's moving, and they, they're sending notices. Uh, she she says a terrible thing here that I would never say. Horrible. Uh, really yeah. horrible. Uh, the way I feel now, if I never see her again, that would be just fine. Yeah. I've never been so mad at my kids that I thought of that. That I'd say something no. like that, you know. That's a bad thing to say. Uh, even about your husband. And she says, I don't feel well, Tony. My joints ache. My stomach's all queasy. You know, and Tony now is assuming she is going through menopause. And that's why she's moody. That's why she's depressed. That's why she's she didn't want to go on vacation. That's why she didn't want to, you know, that's I gotta why tell there's you, tension. Speaking of the vacation, uh, I forgot to bring up, you know, he said to her, maybe that's, you're unfulfilled. Maybe that's why you cut your hair he brings up the hair again right that's a no right. no bro no Big no no you're unfulfilled that's why you come and he, and he ties it into piomai too somehow yeah. and piomai is the dying thing with the and, horse and the thing and maybe that's why you cut your hair uh no good that's and, and also this, uh you know it just shows how clueless he is about her feelings he's really sure. not in tune with her at all right uh you know the funny thing in this scene uh, uh, Jesus Christ, I don't have enough on my plate. One of my key guys disappeared to Naples. Tony and Carmella in this scene are both upset about the same thing. About Furio the same thing. leaving. Right. It, it is. And, and it, that push, camera pushes in on Carmella at the end of the scene. It's very cool. Another they, really cool camera yeah. move and really accents this. But, uh, yeah, he's... It's really the precursor to the Whitecaps episode, which is the next episode, which we'll get into next yeah. week. But it's, uh, you know, the marriage, the, the rift is huge right now. Yeah, they're both upset. Yeah. Uh, AJ's room, AJ's reading. 
Death uh, in Venice, which is a, actually a book about uh, Thomas Mann, a novel about an, a, an older guy, an old guy who's obsessed with this teenage boy. It's another, you know, book another with, one. Uh, gay themes that uh, Mr. Wegler, who's the professor that Carmela had the affair with. Ah, okay. uh, is teaching. That's Mr. Is teaching, okay. uh, these, you know, who's been accused by Tony of being gay. Remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, she seemed yeah. weird to you lately. I guess she's been cr crying a lot, and he tells her that he's been about Furio, that uh, he's went there a few times. Meadow is on to Carmelo and Furio. It's making sense to her now. A hundred percent. And uh, AJ is like, she brought me there. She's upset about Furio's dad. She was going over there a lot. She made me go over. And she's like, what? I mean, the whole thing sounds very, very fishy to Meadow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Meadow's on to it now. Uh, Min's yeah. house. Uh, Paulie's looking for the money under the bed. Uh, now, what was the original thing in this scene? What was supposed to happen originally? Was it supposed to go down a little differently? No, he was supposed to strangle her. And instead, uh, he was supposed to strangle her, and then he told uh, David Chase, uh, Tony said they would hate Paulie if he strangled her, so they compromised, and he smothered her. That's better. <laughs> it kept the image of the, the kind of clean, you know, good, clean, clean-cut image of Paulie intact by smothering her. Well, Tony's one of those actors that, uh, and, and he's not the only one. There's plenty of them. Uh, my character wouldn't do that. My character, uh, I don't want the audience state of John Wayne did that. He always had to be the hero. And those old-time actors, a lot of them had a certain image. And Tony has that as himself also. You know, like it's a reflection on him. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I don't yeah, give yeah. a shit. You know, if it's a character, it's a character. It's not Steve doing it. It's you know, right. Bobby. Tony wouldn't play a rat. That was yeah. the other thing. Yeah, he felt that that was. It wasn't that Paulie wouldn't. It was Tony didn't want to yeah, play a rat. Exactly. You know, certain clothes he won't wear. This. It's a great scene though. Min knows immediately why he's there. She's, she's not a tough stupid. Fraud. She's tough. She's a, she doesn't back down. She's not. She knows. She starts asking for help. She says, "I know you." She knows he's always been a bad guy. She kicks him in the balls. She needs him in the balls. You know, uh, is not a you know, is, is stands up for herself. You, she knows you're here to rob. She says you're here to rob me. She's tough. She's a tough. Uh, uh, tough woman. Shut your mouth! He finally, she keeps on yelling and screaming. She's gonna go call his mother. She won't stop yelling, and he uh, suffocates her and then finds the money. And that Obviously. shot of her after she dies, it's very disturbing. Yeah. Say, you know, her yeah, face for is sure. She dead. said, you're always bad. You're here to he really me, tries huh? to cover up. Yeah, I'm here. Why, you know. Her mom dropped yeah. something off for Ma. He does a good it's job. It's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's Part good. of being back room, Tony's at the desk. Paulie gives him a fat envelope. Now, how much do you think? 20 grand? Maybe to get back in his good graces. This is a whole, you know, he realizes New York he has no future in New York. Yeah, so That's he gives him a big fat envelope. What you do, rob a bank? This should make up for everything. I'm back, you know. And then uh, Patsy tells him he's got a phone call for Johnny Sack, and, and Paulie stays around and listens. He's like, what's that prick want? He's very curious of why Johnny Sack is calling, and Tony doesn't trust him. No. Tony Soprano doesn't trust Paulie to hear this conversation. He's been a little bit suspicious that Tony might be talking, which he's right about. And, and he Paulie brings him the big envelope. Behind the door. He brings him yeah. the big envelope. You're only as good as your last envelope. Soprano house. Meadow's getting ready to leave. Tony comes downstairs. You say goodbye to your mother. She loves you, Meadow. Cut us some slack, will you? You got to understand she's going through a rough time now. How come? Change your life. Kids are growing kids up. growing up, yeah, and you know, but I guess. a lot of guys use the change a life thing, you know. A lot of guys kind of use that. Well, a lot of a lot of marriages fall apart with the you know when the kids are grown and leave the house. A lot of times the couple doesn't last because that was the thing they had in common. Sure. And then when that's over and it's not part of their daily life, they realize they don't have a lot in common, and it's a big kind of a challenging time for. A lot of couples, but he's assuming she's going through menopause, and that's why she's moody and having these depressions and 
and, 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 and he's of, telling uh, her uh, for the first time uh, she finds out that they went to counseling to therapy uh, and Meadow didn't know that Meadow's very surprised oh my god you were in therapy you know which is she's maybe, shocked maybe Carmella is unfulfilled uh, back alley late at night Tony waits Johnny pulls up gets in the car Johnny sacks all about money he's uh, a snake He's, He's a real snake. He does a good job. Uh, Vince does a good job here, as always. If Carmine's health were bad, if something would have happened to him, God forbid, all of this unpleasantness would just uh, – and Tony, you know. Johnny's basically saying we get if rid of you him, were to get rid of Carmine, we're going to make money together and we'll have a good relationship. You're preaching to the choir, he says, you know. Uh Basically, and Carmine did the same thing before, right? Carmine wanted to get rid of Johnny Sack. Remember, yeah. he said to Tony, "I'm not saying I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing." He, he basically said up, to yeah. Tony, "Get rid of Johnny Sack," and so then John, they call that off. John is floating the idea of killing him, of killing Carmine. So, Pato bedroom. Carmelo's in bed. Tony walks in. I talked to Meadow this morning. She's a good kid, Carm. She hates my guts, Tony. She doesn't hate you. She's gonna call you. Finn will go. She'll forget all about him in a couple of weeks. And he says it's, you know, she's a good kid. She's that independent woman that you created. Isn't that what you dreamed about? Um, she's not, you know, she's kind of inconsolable, Carmela. She's still, she's, t t Tony's very tender in this scene, but Carmela's still not, she's suffering. She is, hey, you know, uh, she's really in love with uh, him. This is not. She's really uh, in love. She, uh, and the Annie Lennox tune uh, closes uh, this scene it's called little bird i wish i could be that bird and fly away from here mama i feel so low mama where do i go what do i know which obviously is where you carmella know, is at. you know people are you know I, I, this is something that i always you know like breakups uh you know i don't remember uh going through breakups so easily you know celebrities go from you know they get divorced and, you know, a month later, they're back with someone in a serious relationship. Celebrities to me, not all, but uh, a lot of them just bounce and bounce and bounce, and they don't wallow, it doesn't seem like. I mean, they really move on quick. A lot of them do. I mean, you and I certainly don't, but... No, uh... no, I mean, but that's... <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying, though. I mean, that's serious. I mean, you know, even a breakup, it's like, I mean... I there's one thing, you know, you, you, you're married or you're in a long-term relationship and the next day you're, like, moving in with somebody else. I mean, that's what happens. Happens constantly. Just boom, boom, yeah, boom. Yeah, I guess so. they Well, and celebrities, you, a lot of them, they move on to another celebrity. Sure. Oh, no. It's yeah, all usually. in that world, yeah. But it yeah. just keeps, you know, that's how it goes. I, I don't know. Was it not that serious to begin with? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. A lot of celebrities have very big egos. It's all about them rather than about the relationship. Uh, well, my that obviously doesn't apply to me because I've been in the same relationship for twenty five years. So, where you, where, what are you trying to infer? Whatever you're inferring does did, not hold water. I didn't say anything. <laughs> now it's now time. it's time for the Talking Sopranos <laughs> Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our M A M A best question is Mary from Venice, California. Venice is a great part of Los Angeles. I love Venice, California. We're sending Mary a pair of Bose headphones. Uh, Mary asks, my boyfriend and I saw Michael at a Rangers game once, and it made us wonder, is Tony in the hey, game? Hey, a fan saw you at a Rangers game, I heard. Didn't they get to you through uh, Instagram, yeah. said they saw you at a Ranger game? Yeah. The, the, somebody said to me, a woman said, uh, I heard you on the Howard Stern show. And then I met you at a Rangers game in the Delta Club, and you were very rude to me. You First were very all, rude. That's how you treat the fans, right? You're, when bullshit, they come up to you. With, you, know? you know, you've been with me enough. I'm nice. So those the people <laughs> are nice. I'm always nice, above and beyond. <laughs> well, you and weren't I, nice at this moment. And I've never done the Howard Stern show. So is she talking about me oh, or maybe some she's mistaken other you fat for someone guy? Else. Another fat guy, maybe Vinny Pastor, maybe Jeff Garlin, maybe some other fat, sweaty Italian guy. But you go to Rangers games. I do go to Rangers game here and there. I've, I've been, been in the, the Delta Rangers. Club, but I've not. 
I've never been on the Howard Stern show. So never, but you know Howard Stern. You, you used to. I went to his wife. wedding. I went to his wedding. Yeah. I, I, I've yeah. never met him, but I know Beth. I, yes. Beth's great. She's a They're lovely great. person. And Howard's great, but I've never been on a show as a guest. I mean, you know. Uh, so this lady. Do you know, I when know I was a kid, when I was in, I think I might have been thirteen or fourteen. Howard Stern was on AM radio, WNBC, in New York. I think he had just started in New York. And uh, I used to call in as a, a character uh, on, his show, on really? his show. And I was on the radio a couple of times. Yeah, I was like 13 or 14. And what was the character? I'm not going to say. Well, I'm not you, gonna you're say. giving the fans a half a story here. No, it's enough of a story that I was a kid and I was calling in on uh, Howard Stern. I've never been get, on his show. And you got through. Several times I was on the air, yeah. That's very funny. It's yeah. not easy. Uh, yeah, I was not rude to this lady. I don't know what she's talking about. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, honey. Well, well you know, you got, well, the, you got the wrong fat. Italian well, Mary guy. from Venice saw me at a Rangers game, and she says she doesn't say that I was rude. It made her wonder. <laughs> Is Tony and the gang Jets or Giants fans? Mets or Yankees, Islanders or Rangers, Nets or Knicks. Our guess is Jets, Mets, Rangers, Nets. Thanks. Love the podcast. You're Mary. wrong, Mary. Definitely not the Nets and definitely not the Mets. No. Jets, Yankees, Rangers, Knicks. No oh, Nets. Oh, yeah. We're big Knicks fans. We're big Knicks, Knicks fans. And I know they're talking about and Yankee fans. Tony and the gang. They're talking about, but then again, she is talking about the characters. She didn't see Christopher at the Ranger game. She saw me. I know. She, that was just two different things. Is Tony no, and not. the gang Jets or Giants fans? Tony. Tony Soprano. He's a, I would say he's a Jet fan. A Yankee, and a Yankee fan. fan. Ranger and fan, a Knicks fan. Nick yeah. fan. Though the Nets at one point were the New Jersey Nets. You know. I say they're still uh, Nick fans, Nick but it's fans, a good question. Yeah. It's actually we never. This is a one of a kind. We've never gotten this question. This is a good question, Mary. I like this question a lot. I person uh, personally, too. I mean, I, I'm kind of biased, so I'm going to say, of course, Yankees. I mean, I've been a Yankee fan before I was born. And I there's mean, a I lot of Yankee like, fans from New Jersey. A lot of the Yankee fans from New Jersey. I would say Soprano. And the gangs, the Soprano, you know, the whole gang are certainly Yankee fans. Met fans are more Queens, Long Island people. Right. And the Most Islanders, because they were a Long Island team. Long that Island. was a lot of Queens, Long Island. Yankee, you know, Jet fans are an in interesting, because at, at one point they were playing at Yankee Stadium. You know, the Jets at some at some well, point. Well, years ago. But, yeah, but they're playing, they play yeah. in the Meadowlands. But before they, they played at the Meadowlands, they were at Shea Stadium. Uh, Shea Stadium, and before that, they played. I mean, I remember seeing them at Yankee Stadium. Really? You know, they used to have this called the Yale Bowl. I don't know if they. I don't think they have it anymore. It was the Jets versus the Giants. It was preseason game up Yale University, and I was a little kid, and I went with my father and his cousins, and it was. I mean, the most raucous thing. I mean, it was it was scary for a little kid. There were fights. I remember there was a guy with a crutch beating someone on the head with it. One guy was taking off. Women were lifting their shirts up. Some guy pulled down his pants and was dancing. I mean, it was frightening. I was probably at six. I didn't know what the hell was going on. People were so messed up at that game. Drunk. It was a riot, almost like a riot. Like ten people started swinging right near where we were. It was terrible. That sounds pretty good. Never forget uh, it. I would say, Mary, I'm going to say, Tony and the gang are Jet fans, Yankee fans, Ranger fans, or Devil fans, and I would say they may be Net fans. And you'd say Jets over Giants, even though Giants were always the New Jersey team. Oh, yeah, not I would always, say Jets. I would say Jets. Now, on a personal yeah. level, Jim I, loved the Jets. Jim he loved the Jets. Jets. He loved the so, Jets. So, so, so do and I. you like the I Jets. The Jets. Yeah, uh, I'm I not a football guy. I'm a Yankee fan. I'm a Ranger fan and a Nick fan. 
Uh, I think they would only like the Nets when they were in New Jersey. They wouldn't like the Brooklyn Nets. No, they may, they may be now they're Knicks fans. Good question. That's what I think. So I think Tony and the gang, a Jet, Jets, Yankees, Rangers, and New Jersey Nets, and Steve and Michael are uh, Yankees, Rangers, Knicks, Rangers, and Knicks. you're a Jet fan. I'm a Jet fan. I was a Jet fan, and when I, uh, and and I'm a Minnesota Viking fan. Really? How that? When I was out? a kid in the seventies, I just liked the the way I liked their game. The purple in the 70s. people Fran, eaters. Purple Fran people Tarkenton eaters. and Chuck Foreman and uh, Ahmad Rashad, um, Alan Page, the purple Peter, pe- people eaters, a defense. They were an exciting team in the seventies. All right, good question, Mary. Thanks, we Mary. We like that. We like that question. Very good. Uh and uh, you will be getting your Bose headphones. So enjoy. Thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. And right now, you can get official Talking Sopranos merchandise on TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Our producer is Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amaton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. We record Talking Sopranos at NYC Podcasting, which is New York's premier podcasting studio. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. All right. Good talking to you, pal. See See you next week. week.